1976, uh, Michael Bussey uh, gathers a bunch of these ministries, these ex gay ministries, come together in a conference in Southern California. And they start what's called Exodus International. If you know your Bible, the book of Exodus is the second book. And it's the story of how Moses leads the Israelites out of, out of captivity and into the Promised Land. Um, the idea behind this name being that God can lead people out of the captivity of homosexuality and bring them to freedom. Um, Mike, so Mr. Bussey and another man by the name of Gary Cooper, they uh, had been cured, so to speak. They were married, they had children, they toured the country together telling churches about their own miraculous transformations. And they spent so much time together that they actually fell in love and got married <laughs> um, in 1982. This is five years after uh, the Exodus was born. So today, <laughs> we have a number of programs. We have Exodus International, and that is the umbrella group. It's the largest in the world, and it encompasses evangelical uh, Christian networks. There's Courage, which is a group of Catholics. Jonah is the group for Jews trying to overcome homosexuality. Just an interesting fact, the uh, founder of Jonah is actually a convicted felon. Uh, he went to prison for 15 months for defrauding Guam. There's Evergreen International, which is the group for Mormons. Uh, there's a support group for parents and friends of ex-gays. International Healing Foundation is Richard Cohen's group. It's this guy, Richard Cohen. <laughs> And uh, NARTH is an organization that is supposedly made up of professionals and uh, supposedly a secular group. But, uh, we'll come back to them later, too. Anyway, so after I saw the Daily Show program, um, I started attending weekly meetings. Uh, these are small group meetings. They meet in churches, sometimes literally in the basements of churches. Um, and there is a lot of praying. There's a lot of scripture study. I also attended two conferences that were designed for straight Christians who are trying to figure out how to deal with questions regarding homosexuality. These are parents who show up and say, you know, my kid says he's gay, my neighbor says he's gay. How do I react? And the Bible condemns it, but I'm also supposed to love my neighbor as myself. So how would I reconcile these two views? So I attended a couple of conferences. And lastly, I attended a 48-hour weekend retreat called Journey into Manhood. Um, this is basically 50 men going off to the woods in northern Arizona to hold and cure each other of their same-sex attractions. Um, I will need six male volunteers um, in a few minutes. Anyway. So, people have asked me, how did you pull it off? I and mean, what was it like for you to try to pretend to be gay? And one of the things that it's important to know is that these are all religious programs. So you have to know your Bible. You have to act on it. Um, luckily, because I was raised Mormon, I knew my Bible and I knew my way around Scripture. So it wasn't very difficult for me to pull off that part of the act. Um, and I was acting basically as you see me now. I didn't really try to change my mannerisms or anything like that. I just went in like I am now just to see what would happen. And I learned a really interesting lesson um, about that. Um, the fact that I was able to pull this off for so long and that no one copied me. But I'll come back to that in the end. You have to be careful with your language. When you become a Christian, um, there are certain things you don't do, like you don't cuss, and you don't blaspheme, and you don't take the name of God in vain. This is extremely difficult for somebody like me. <laughs> <laughs> because um, in one meeting, the pastor opened up with a prayer, and he's, he has his, uh, his, his head bowed, and he's praying. He says, we ask you, Jesus, that you will come down and you will touch these men in a way that no man has ever touched them before. <laughs> and it's really hard to not say, what the fuck? <laughs> um, in order to blend in, I had to wear nice shoes. I don't know why this was, but uh, a lot of the men were always wearing really nice shoes, and I was always wearing ratty tennis shoes all my life, so I had to start wearing better footwear. Um, and you should have a cover story for your interview. Um, all of these programs have some kind of process of getting in. You can't just walk in. Uh, most of the programs don't advertise where they meet or at what time. Uh, you have to contact them, and then they arrange an interview off-site. Uh, this is where they ask you questions about your life, about growing up, about your goals in the program. One of the reasons that they do this is so, well, apparently, they've had problems with men trolling these groups of dates. Um, but it's also to kind of help you um, have a better expectation of what will happen as you go through these programs. Um, 
they kind of advertise this idea that we can cure you, we can make you straight. But as I got deeper into the programs, I realized that that really wasn't the case. That's not really what's going on. Um, and you can expect to get hit on. Um, this comes in the form of men coming up to you and putting their hand on your leg, or um, asking you out for coffee, or asking you out to movies, and things like that. This happens quite a bit. In fact, men in the XK programs spend a lot of time hanging out with each other. A lot of times it's because they just don't have anyone else to be around. Um, they've lived positive lives. They haven't told their pastors. They haven't told their spouses. They haven't told their friends. They haven't told, they haven't told their parents. These are men and women who live very lonely lives. And it may be difficult, especially for the straight people in the audience here, to really understand what's, what that is like, to have to hide your orientation. That is something I don't understand. That is something I will never be able to identify. Um, but it is a tragic thing to think that you just can't be yourself, that you cannot be affectionate with the people that you're attracted to because of your fears. So these programs don't subscribe to the idea that uh, there is a biological or a genetic uh, factor that causes homosexuality or same-sex attraction. There are two reasons for this. Number one is God doesn't make people gay. And two, um, a big part of the narrative of ex gay programs is that somebody converts you or someone brings you to homosexuality. And as we'll see later, that has a very strong political message where these groups are saying that homosexuals are in your schools, and they're trying to convert your kids. So they've come up with another hypothesis as to what causes same-sex attraction. And uh, probably the easiest way to show it is with this uh, children's book called uh, Alfie's House. Uh, this is the story of a young man named Alfie who lives a horrible life at home. His parents are always yelling at each other. His dad is distant and always working. Uh, Mom is overbearing. She is a little too affectionate with Alfie. She uh, shares a little too much information. She's overstepping her bounds as a mom. Um, so poor Alfie, he's, he's by himself. He doesn't have a good male role model to help him identify with his own masculinity. But uh, he does find someone who is understanding, and that's Uncle Pete. And, uh, <laughs> Uncle Pete will come over to the house, and he'll spend the night, and he'll sleep in Alfie's bed. And he'll show Alfie how to touch him in, in his special. This idea that someone abused you, that there's some kind of sexual abuse, is rampant within the ex gay programs. In fact, there are cases of uh, counselors trying to recover lost or hidden memories and trying to help you resurface that old abuse that you completely forgot. Um, in fact, there's a whole list of things that can, uh, can uh, turn you gay. This is from gaystraight.org. Um, well, some interesting ones, um, your over-attachment to your opposite sex parents, there's the neglect or abuse. There's your artistic nature on number two. <laughs> um, some other possible reasons uh, might be number five, name calling or put downs. Number six, you could be uh, skinnier, larger, shorter, or taller than other people. That's what they do it for you. Lack of hand-eye coordination. <laughs> Still not done, all the different things. Uh, sexual abuse, you can be the teacher's pet if you're non athletic. Uh, the internet, media, the educational system, all those public schools and their pro gay agenda. Uh, my personal favorite is under number 10 religion. <laughs> the idea is, is that uh, according to these groups, same sex attraction isn't really the issue. The issue is deeper emotional wounds that need to be addressed. And the way it's like, like uh, uh, Joe Dallas here describes it, it's like a warning light on your dashboard and that there are other things that need to be addressed. And if you address these emotional wounds, if you address these needs, then your same-sex attractions will disappear. 